of 16 years of data that now contradict the global warming narrative, Obama and the UN are going to pretend that their predictive model hasn't failed. It's simply a pause in the global warming trend. They need to pretend that there is some kind of a correlation between CO2 and global warming so that they can force humans to pay a global regime for the use of any energy. And it isn't just carbon taxes and global regulation that they're pushing. They're also trying to shut down most power plants and prevent new ones from being built. Obama loves the nuclear industry as much as he hates the coal industry. In the first part of this report, we're going to look at the issues of nuclear safety and nuclear waste disposal. In the wake of Typhoon Man Yi, the Fukushima nuclear power plant dumped 1,130 tons of contaminated water into the ocean. Now, the reported levels were below what the Japanese government considers to be safe. But we learned just in the last couple of weeks that previously reported radiation levels were actually 18 times higher than reported, and that 300 tons of radioactive water leak into the ocean every day. And dangerously high levels of radiation have been discovered in groundwater. The highly radioactive groundwater contamination is due to leaking storage vessels that are holding the water that was used in the original disaster. Maintaining the ice wall will use enough energy to power thousands of homes, even if it works. Spent reactor fuel, containing roughly 85 times more long-lived radioactivity than was released at Chernobyl, still sits in pools that are vulnerable to earthquakes. Several of these pools are 100 feet above ground. These pools could possibly topple or collapse from structural damage coupled with another powerful earthquake. And the loss of water exposing the spent fuel could cause fire that could deposit large amounts of radioactive material over hundreds, if not thousands, of miles. But what about nuclear plants within the United States? Dr. Yaxo, a Nuclear Regulatory Commission member for seven years and former NRC chairman, said in April of 2013 that all 104 nuclear reactors have safety problems that can't be fixed and should be shut down. Noting the potential to have more failures like Fukushima, he said, continuing to put Band-Aid on Band-Aid is not going to fix the problem. Of course, there are many ways that nuclear plants can fail, but in this particular mode, there are 23 reactors in the U.S. that use the same technology as Fukushima, 12 in seismically active areas. Manufacturers like GE Hitachi will tell you there's nothing to worry about, but evidently they're worried enough about it that they got releases from governments like Japan and Canada, releasing them for liability that will be borne by the taxpayers like this half-billion-dollar ice wall. Public concern has focused on catastrophic reactor events like Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, but as we saw in Fukushima, pools of spent fuel represent a great danger as well. Spent nuclear fuel is extraordinarily radioactive and must be handled with great care. An unprotected person just a foot away from a recently removed fuel assembly could receive a lethal dosage in just a matter of seconds. As one of the most dangerous materials on the planet, spent reactor fuel requires permanent geological isolation to protect humans for thousands of years. And, of course, politics and money are driving decisions more than safety. Plans to move spent fuel to remote, sparsely populated areas like Yucca Mountain have been overruled by powerful politicians like Harry Reid. As a result, the largest storage pools in the country are located in a heavily populated area at a reactor complex, Sharon Harris, just outside Raleigh, North Carolina, transported from other reactors by rail through high population centers on the East Coast. Scientists at MIT and Princeton warned that spent fuel recently discharged from a reactor could heat up relatively rapidly and catch fire. The fire could spread to older fuel, and the long-term contamination consequences of such an event could be significantly worse than Chernobyl. In part two of this report, we'll look at the health and economic costs involved in decommissioning old nuclear power plants. And we'll look at the love affair that many environmentalists have with nuclear power. Managers at the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant are trying to resolve a problem that's been hampering the cleanup operation. They say they'll soon test a filtering system that could remove most radioactive substances from wastewater that's accumulating at the site. Officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, say the advanced liquid processing system is the key to their plans to purify the contaminated water. The company aims to decontaminate thousands of tons of stored wastewater by March 2015.
TEPCO engineers initially planned to begin using the system in August, but they postponed their decision after they found a water leak during a test run in June. The officials say the leak was most likely caused by the chemicals that corroded the system. Engineers have since reinforced the system with a corrosion-proof material. Workers will begin a test run of one of the systems on Friday. They plan to start the remaining two systems by mid-November. Once the systems are fully operational, TEPCO officials expect they'll be able to treat 500 tons of contaminated water per day. The utility plans to increase the filtering capacity by introducing higher performance systems. However, these filters cannot remove tritium, a radioactive isotope of hydrogen with weaker energy. It exists mainly in the form of water. TEPCO has still not decided how it will eventually dispose of the filtered water. Kashiwazaki Kariwa in Niigata Prefecture is the world's largest nuclear power plant. Operator Tokyo Electric Power Company is again trying to persuade Niigata's governor to support restarting two of its seven reactors. TEPCO head Naomi Hirose wants Hirohiko Izumida's approval for government safety checks to the reactors. The last time they met in July, the two men clashed. Hirose was hoping for a better reception when they met on Wednesday. In July, Izumida criticized TEPCO for pushing ahead with the safety checks without local consent. He accused the utility of trying to install vents at the plant without informing the prefectural authority. Hirose took a pile of documents on to Tuesday's meeting. To Wednesday's meeting, rather, the documents detail the modifications being done at Kashiwazaki Kariwa to meet stringent new safety guidelines. Please take these documents to allow the installation of filter vents at the plant. The governor refused to take the documents in July. He accepted them this time, but still showed he would be no pushover. I've asked this question before, and I'll ask it again. Which is more important for TEPCO, money or safety? Hirose says, naturally enough, safety. Struggling TEPCO is desperate to restart the number 6 and number 7 reactors of the 7 reactor facility. But first, they have to be screened under the government's tough new safety guidelines. Governor Izumida has questioned the use of new mandatory filter vents. The vents are supposed to relieve pressure in reactor containment vessels during an emergency. But Izumida says the vents will end up releasing radioactive material. He says TEPCO failed to tell the prefectural government about their installation. Hirose says TEPCO intends to install the vents to help limit any radiation release. He hopes the Niigata prefectural authority will give its consent. I want to establish once and for all, is TEPCO in a hurry to seek the government's safety screening? Certainly. We need checks, first of all, by someone who is knowledgeable about the plant. The governor has signaled he's willing to look at the TEPCO documents, but he gave no indication he'll consent to safety checks or to restarting reactors. The Fukushima Daiichi disaster has put TEPCO deeply in the red. The utility has learned it'll have to find another $10 billion to deal with contaminated water at the Fukushima plant and decommission its reactors. TEPCO currently has to rely on thermal plants, which means big outlays in fuel costs. It hopes that getting those reactors back online at Kashiwazaki Kariwa will give it some breathing space. Rice farmers in Fukushima have also struggled over the past two and a half years. Now those from a town near the damaged plant are preparing to ship their crop for the first time since the 2011 accident. Hirono is located within the 30-kilometer radius around Fukushima Daiichi. Farmers voluntarily stopped growing rice following the disaster because of concerns about radiation contamination. The levels of radioactive materials in last year's harvest were below the government's safety limit. So the farmers decided to take this year's harvest to market once it's tested. Members of an agricultural cooperative in a neighboring town are checking rice fresh from paddies. We will test every single bag. That way we will be able to market our rice because people will know that it was thoroughly tested. Only rice that meets a standard that is stricter than the government's safety limit will be shipped to market. Now farmers in Hirono are waiting to see if consumers will buy their product. 
fishermen from Fukushima, Japan, have unloaded five tons of marine life they hauled in. After resuming test catches, they suspended offshore trial fishing at the beginning of the month following revelations that highly radioactive water was leaking at the damaged nuclear plant. Crews of 21 trawlers returned to a port in the city of Soma in northern Fukushima. Officials say the trial catches resumed after tests showed marine life in seawater were safe. Fishermen can only go after 16 types of seafood that were found to have either no contamination or levels of radiation well within safety limits. And they must drop their nets, traps or lines at least 50 kilometers from the plant at a depth of at least 150 meters. The crews unloaded 5.2 tons, including giant octopus, spear squid and hairy crab. They're having samples tested for radioactivity. If it's safe, the cooperative plans to ship the catch to local markets, Tokyo and elsewhere. We don't want consumers to feel biased about our fish. We want to show they're just like any other fish caught anywhere else. The Fukushima Fisheries Federation plans to start trial catches next month off the southern part of the prefecture. Fishing there hasn't resumed since the nuclear crisis began. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has reassured world leaders the leaks of contaminated water from Fukushima Daiichi are under control. But marine scientists from Japan and abroad say there are much more they must do to get things better. NHK World's Yoichiro Tatehiwa has more on today's nuclear watch. At last week's meeting of the Oceanographic Society of Japan, experts offer a range of views on the impact the Fukushima accident will have on the ocean. But they were uncertain about how exactly to analyze the impact of radiation on the ocean. TEPCO has collected data, but it's very difficult to understand. It's hard to find out what data TEPCO actually has, and what we have found isn't helping us much with our research. Professor Jota Kanda has been studying the impact of what's happening at the plant. He thinks those in charge need to take a different approach. It's crucial that people with expertise in different fields come together, people who understand the impact on the land and the ocean. We should work to create a forum where we can exchange information. U.S. experts on the effects of radiation on the ocean are also weighing in. Ken Bissler has been studying the situation since shortly after the accident. He used the Japanese government data to determine a year ago that tainted water was leaking into the open ocean. He says TEPCO's lack of transparency combined with the government's hands-off attitude has fostered international distrust, leading to overreaction. Yeah, I think there's a lot of overreaction by other countries in the U.S. and as you said, there's fisheries in Korea. We measure the water we look at the fish, your Ministry of Fisheries and Forestries measures tens of thousands of fish samples. So we know where the fish are highest, and that's near Fukushima and near the bottom of the ocean. And so if we avoid those fish and those fisheries are closed, then no one is eating those fish in Japan, no one is eating them in America or in Korea. That should be okay. Bissell says Japanese officials must seek solutions to the Fukushima crisis in partnership with foreign experts. Well, there was a recent editorial in Nature magazine, and the call was for Abe, your prime minister, to come up with an international cleanup and research effort. Japan is doing more than any other country. They should continue in the universities, the scientists, and TEPCO. But by having other groups confirm that, at least we could maybe slowly rebuild some confidence. Japanese government leaders have decided to step in to oversee the problems at the plant. But experts in Japan and abroad say authorities need to be more inclusive by sharing what they find out about the leaks. They say even then, Japanese leaders will have a long way to go before they regain trust. Yoichiro Tateiwa, NHK World.
Three Japanese-flagged fishing vessels were captured off Brazil in July and August. Two were released, but one is still being held in the country. Brazilian authorities have released the Kinsai Maru No. 58 and the Shoei Maru No. 7, but they're still holding the Kie Maru No. 108. Officials at the Brazilian Institute of Environment and Natural Resources said the three ships had violated the country's regulations for protecting seabirds. The Kie Maru captain was briefly arrested for not complying with the regulations. His ship and tuna catch were confiscated. Officials at the Japanese embassy in Brazil said the three vessels followed the international rules. They have filed complaints at a Brazilian court. The court gave two ships permission to leave Brazil while ruling against the Kie Maru. The third vessel has been held in a southern Brazilian port for nearly two months. British media report that a Cold War mission to watch against a Soviet nuclear attack almost ended in disaster. They say a U.S. B-52 bomber carrying two hydrogen bombs was flying over the state of North Carolina in January 1961 when something went wrong. The plane broke up in midair and the bombs plummeted to Earth. The Guardian newspaper and the BBC quote declassified documents which describe how close one of the bombs came to exploding. The documents say three of the four safety mechanisms designed to prevent unintended detonation failed to operate properly. However, the fourth safety mechanism did operate, averting a catastrophe. The bomb was 260 times more powerful than the atomic bomb that devastated Hiroshima in 1945. If it had exploded, it would have become the worst nuclear disaster in history, affecting cities as far away as Washington, D.C. and New York. Japan has one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Around 30,000 people take their own lives each year. For one Irishman in Japan, that statistic became personal when a friend killed herself. So he decided to take action. I dream of a war. A war on suicide. But I don't even know who is the enemy. Saving 10,000 people from suicide each year, reducing the total number of deaths by a third. That is the goal and the message of an award-winning documentary that delves into the deep-seated problem of suicide in Japan, drawing on interviews with almost 100 people. The film is the work of René Dignan, an economist from Ireland who has lived in Japan for 16 years. Filming in Tokyo and other parts of the country, he spent three years and about $30,000 of his own money making the documentary. Dignan's decision to make the film came after a neighbor committed suicide five years ago. She was trying to reach out to me for help and quite frankly I ignored her. It left me with a huge sense of regret that I should have done more, that I should have taken the time to listen. As he worked on the project, Dignan began to realize just how many Japanese are struggling with a sense of alienation, just like his neighbor had been. No one to talk to, and no one aware of her pain. あの、そういう電話保護センターみたいなとこ入ったんですけど、なんか扱いが冷たいんですよね。で、次行ったのが警察になんか連絡したんです。もちろん警察はそんな全然何も
してくれないしここは一番立つ多い場所なんですねここに一人で日没を待っているんですよ座ってるんですよ誰か声かけてくれるのを待っているんですね誰も死にたくないんですって助けを待ってるんですって Dignan released the film last year. Since he uploaded it to YouTube in March, it's been viewed more than 200,000 times in six months. People around Japan have posted messages. It made me think a lot. Finding out that I'm not the only one is a great relief. In making the film, Dignan worked closely with a non-profit group that provides suicide prevention services in Japan. Inochi no Denwa, the lifeline for suicide prevention, has a nationwide network staffed by volunteers who work around the clock. Last year, they took 750,000 phone calls, far more than they were equipped to handle. Dignan believes that a lot more could be done that would help reduce the number of suicides. That's why uh, lifelines are so busy you can't get through. So uh, this, is, this is a simple thing, it's a recommendation, but it's something that we can all do, is take the time to listen. Friends, family members, co-workers, it's a start. Recently, Dignan was invited to speak at a meeting organized by TEL, the English language branch of the Lifeline. He believes the first step toward preventing suicide is to create a society in which people feel able to discuss their problems openly. One message I always get across in Japan is that, you know, there's a lot of people want to talk, but there's very few people who want to listen. I don't think we should look at suicide as a taboo issue. We've got to get beyond that. We've got to talk about it. We've got to talk about the causes of suicide. And that is one of the key solutions to solving the problem. Every hour in Japan, more than three people take their lives. Dignan says he will continue to work and bring his message to all the people he can. Officials of Japanese sake breweries are trying to expand sales overseas. They have held a tasting event in Los Angeles as part of their attempt. The Japan External Trade Organization invited some 200 owners and retailers of non-Japanese restaurants. 29 brewers showed off more than 100 types of sake at the event. The United States is the biggest sake importer in the world. It accounts, uh, in fact, for some 30 percent of Japan's shipments of the liquor overseas. But most of the beverage currently goes only to Japanese restaurants. I think it goes well with food. It's not overpowering. I think it would balance well with a lot of different dishes. Some types of sake taste good with meat dishes. I would like many Americans to try the drink. A Chinese government official is vowing to take a tough line on North Korea's nuclear ambitions. Foreign Ministry spokesman Hong Lei says Beijing will play a leading role in efforts to strip the North of weapons of mass destruction. Chinese authorities have released a long list of materials banned from exports to North Korea. Officials at China's Commerce Ministry say the materials could be used to make nuclear and biological weapons. The list shows that the Chinese government strictly handles the matter based on resolutions by the UN Security Council and the domestic law. Hong says he hopes members of six-party talks on North Korea's nuclear program can resume negotiations soon. The talks have been suspended since 2008, but the U.S., Japan, and South Korea say they won't rejoin the negotiations until the North takes steps to dismantle its nuclear program. Managers of a Japanese company have gathered with Iraqi leaders to mark a milestone. They've started full-scale production of crude oil at a field in the south. Crews with Japan Petroleum Exploration Company began production at the Garaf oil field at the end of August. JAPEX worked on the project with a Malaysian firm. Iraqi Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki attended a ceremony celebrating the occasion. He said the two companies in partnership with Iraq will increase oil production and help lead the country to prosperity. Garaf is a mid-sized oil field with an estimated reserve of 1.3 billion barrels. 
JAPEX managers plan a daily output of 230,000 barrels by 2017. That's more than 5% of Japan's total imports. Exports to Japan could start as early as next year. We're proud of achieving the full-scale production much earlier than other oil firms that participate in this project. I'm convinced this will contribute to recovery of the Iraqi economy. I believe this could draw more Japanese firms into investments in Iraq. Japanese firms had a stake in crude oil development in Iraq in the 1970s. But this is the first time a company has been involved in full-scale production there. The member states rejected a draft resolution calling on Israel to join the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Arab states submitted the resolution which called on Israel to join the treaty and accept IAEA inspectors at all of its nuclear facilities. Forty-three countries, mainly those in the Middle East, voted in favor of the resolution. But 51 states, including Japan, the United States and European countries, voted against the proposal. Israel is widely believed to have possessed nuclear weapons since the late 1960s, making it the only country to do so in the Middle East. It has neither denied nor admitted a nuclear arsenal and has refused to join the NPT. Delegates to the International Atomic Energy Agency have adopted a resolution condemning North Korea's third nuclear test. The test happened last February. The resolution urges authorities in Pyongyang to cease all nuclear-related activities. IAEA member states adopted the resolution by consensus on the final day of their annual session at the agency's headquarters in Vienna. More than 50 countries, including Japan, the U.S. and South Korea, jointly proposed the resolution. It expresses deep concern about the decision to reactivate an experimental reactor in the north. Authorities in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea announced in April that they would revive the reactor at the Nyombyon complex. The unit had been deactivated under an international agreement. The DPRK must immediately cease all nuclear activities, reverse any actions to restart its nuclear facilities at Yongbyon, and return to cooperation with the IAEA. Japanese Ambassador Toshiro Ozawa says the resolution's stern language sends a strong message to North Korea. The resolution calls on authorities in the North to accept IAEA inspectors. The team has been unable to visit since 2009 when they were forced to leave the country. Many leaders taking part in the General Assembly have called for tougher action against North Korea. Now Chinese authorities have taken a step to prevent the North Koreans from developing weapons of mass destruction. They've released a list of goods and technologies banned for export to the country. Officials at China's Commerce Ministry say the items could be used to develop nuclear facilities, biological weapons and missiles. The list is more than 230 pages long. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met last week with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi. Kerry expressed his concerns about the nuclear development program. He pointed to reports that North Korean authorities have restarted an experimental nuclear reactor. Analysts say the Nyombyon facility is capable of generating weapons-grade plutonium. Government agencies and major corporations store increasing amounts of confidential information on their computer networks. Some have found that makes them targets for a cyber attack. The breaches can come from just about anywhere. That's forced government officials in Japan and elsewhere to shore up their defenses. NHK World's Kurando Tago reports. These technicians are playing our conflict on a battlefield of servers and circuits. Officials from the Japanese Defense Ministry and four other government agencies have gathered in this facility. They're coordinating their response to a simulated cyber attack. Japan lags behind in dealing with issues of this kind. We need these drills to significantly boost our ability to respond to cyber attacks. Besides figures are hard to come by, 
One government affiliated body says the number of reported incidents jumped to 4,500 in June, more than double the figure in January. It says there have been more attacks since the relationship between Japan and China came under strain. Hackers have targeted Japanese government employees with an increasing number of emails with viruses attached. These technicians are simulating how they would respond to an attempt to penetrate their networks. Participants are divided into teams of up to four people. They have to measure the scale of the attack, assess the damage, then find out where it's coming from. We want to improve Japan's information security and minimize leaks to show the world the safety of operating in Japan. Earlier this month, Japanese officials met with their counterparts from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. They agreed to develop a new system to warn about potential dangers. Government officials are learning more and more about the destructive potential of cyber attacks. They're defining strategies to neutralize new types of threats. They're hoping they can react and change as quickly as those who are attacking them. Kurando Tago, NHK World, Tokyo. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper have agreed to start high-level talks to discuss Japan's shale gas imports from Canada. Abe met with Harper in Ottawa on Tuesday. Abe mentioned a pipeline project in which some Japanese firms are taking part. They are hoping to start shipments to Japan in six years. Abe asked Harper to approve the shale gas export plan as soon as possible. He said Japan hopes to import a steady supply of cheap natural gas. Harper said the hurdles for approval are not very high. I have high hopes for ministerial level talks between the two countries to secure a stable supply of natural gas at competitive prices. Both prime ministers agreed that ministers from the two countries should discuss financial cooperation frameworks and other matters for an early start to trade of shale gas.